Welcome to another Colors Abroad. Uh, it's the uh, YouTube channel where I discuss progressive rock recordings, artists, uh, studio albums, as well as live albums, and pretty much careers. Uh, this is season two of this show. Uh, I started last year. Uh, the season one was in December, I believe, of 2020. So. We've been at this for a while. This time we're going to take a, a different angle. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to talk about a particular artist. This time, Bill Bruford, the drummer, percussionist. Now, there are quite a many drummers in music, so whether it be jazz, fusion, rock, etc., that are well revered and rightfully so for their talents. I mean, uh, Carl Palmer, Palmer from Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Charlie Watts from the Rolling Stones, uh, Keith Moon from The Who. Um, the, the list is tremendous and goes on, but Bruford is of particular interest because he has played with many progressive rock bands and is known uh, as quite an interesting artist on his own with his own work and his own bands. Uh, Bruford is one of the very few musicians to cross over uh, into other prog bands during a lengthy career. He originally learned jazz and improvisational percussion techniques while still at school in the early 60s. Now, he, in, I find it interesting. He was in the small R&B bands around that time period, including a soul R&B cover band uh, sometime uh, 1967. I believe it was a four-piece. Now, he joined Yes in 1968, and at that time, the band consisted of John Anderson, Chris Squire, Peter Banks on guitar, and Tony Kaye on keyboards. So that would be uh, the first Yes album, uh, which everyone knows what that looks like. Uh, and he's been around for a while, and he was on the first five Yes albums. So he's on Yes, released in 69, Time and the Word, 1970, The Yes Album, 1971, which is this cover. For those of you who are unfamiliar, this is one of the remastered ones. Fragile, 71, Close to the Edge, and 72. So Bruford made a claim once that Chris Squire's playing sound, and he, Chris Squire, the bass player and singer and songwriter for Yes, has a very distinctive bass sound. So Bruford had said, he's gone on record saying, Squire's insistence on playing in such a thick, trebly manner and tone led Bruford to develop a more unique drumming style to fill in the gaps and support Squire's bass playing, you know, the gaps of space and air. If you guys know the uh, instrumental ins and outs of drumming, you know, uh, the bass player supports the drummer uh, and the rhythm guitar player supports the, it, the that's how it works in a band. And um, interestingly enough, Bruford found himself playing in the open spaces of sound around to support and be supported by Chris Squire. And then, of course, the guitarist at the time, whoever was playing with the band. Uh, it's interesting sound and style, which in a kin, one could say this is like Charlie Watts, the late Charlie Watts' role in the Rolling Stones. He not only provided a very jazzy backbeat, but he worked more with the guitar player or in this case, it was Keith Richards. Then he did with Bill Wyman, and then later Daryl Jones. 
So interesting styles that drummers have. So Bruford uh, had such a particular big, it almost sounded like polyrhythmic, and he was a heavy, it sounded like he was a heavy hitter, but probably not. Just he was so good. Very interesting. The sound almost probably could be on the edge of avant-garde drumming because he was very much influenced by jazz as well. So that could be one of the reasons. So after Close to the Edge, Bill Bruford joins King Crimson. Now, although he happened uh, to tour at Crimson before recording with them, he was on the, uh, the live tour to support in the Court of the Crimson King after the previous drummer left. So Bru Bruford appeared on Locke's Tongue and Aspic, which everybody knows it's that Crimson album. Starless and Bible Black. Red. And he was uh, on the subsequent tours. You know, to support those albums. Uh, Crimson was known at that time to tour incredibly, incessantly, often. The USA Live Tour of Crimson was often called one of the best live King Crimson tours with the 1974-75 lineup. That was released as an album called USA Live. And some Crimson fans refer to it as some of their best work yet. But years later, King Crimson will go down even more. R.T. Rhodes, if one could possibly say. Now, oddly enough, Bruford joined Gong for a tour of Europe when their drummer became unavailable, and he spent the next two years doing session work. This is after he left Crimson in 75. Um, he appeared on Chris Squire's Fish Out of Water, debut solo CD, HQ by Roy Harper, and even Pavlov's Dog at the Sound of the Bell. Now, everyone knows that band. If you're not too familiar with what they sounded like, they were notorious as one of the proto shriek rock, uh, hard rock bands in the uh, early 70s, early to mid 70s. Now, he also, Bill, also, Bill Bruford also joined Brand X and, um, for a period of time and he toured with them. So it was very interesting. And that's where he got to know Phil Collins because there was a period when. Bill Bruford and Phil Collins were both drumming with Bran X. So, Bruford then joined Genesis. Can you believe it? This is true. Bill Bruford joined Genesis on their first tour without Peter Gabriel because Phil Collins was doing all the lead vocals at this period. And uh, they brought in a support drummer, which was Bruford. And uh, unfortunately, he did not stay too long, so his uh, work live can be heard on uh, a few songs on Seconds Out, the Genesis live album released in 77, and on Three Sides Live released in 82. Now, so Bruford left Genesis, and he did his own thing. And his first solo album is called Feels Good to Me. It featured Dave Stewart from uh, Hatfield in the North, which is a well-respected uh, uh, band in the Canterbury sound and style. Uh, Jeff Berlin, jazz fusion bassist on bass, and Alan's, Alan Holdsworth on guitar. They called themselves Bruford. It's a great band name. And they toured with the addition of John Goodsall from Brand X on guitar. So right away, it's just mind blowing. Uh, if anyone saw those tours, uh, congrats. That was 1978, 79. 
So right after this, he joined another Crimson alumni, John Wetton, Alan Holdsworth, and Eddie Jobson to form UK, a sort of pop prog supergroup. Uh, UK had a number of uh, hits, uh, but the band members could just could not get along, uh, no surprise. And so Bruford left after the first album and a two-year tour. He revived his own band, Bruford, with the addition of John Clark on guitar. And bizarrely, uh, John Clark uh, was often billed on the Bruford albums as the unknown John Clark, yes, the unknown John Clark. And Clark had been a session guitarist and played with British pop star Cliff Richard for many years, both on record and tour. Uh, but Clark's sound with Bruford would take on a more jazz, jazz fusion kind of sound. One of a kind. The Bruford tapes, if anybody remembers, this album, and when and when the retailers tried to introduce a new band to the market, they would do things. This is not a label, by the way. This is actually on the album. So just at retail price, five ninety eight. Do you remember when a record cost five ninety eight? <laughs> and the proof in the pudding, but in this particular one, you can actually see the unknown John Clark. So, there, there's this, and there's Gradually Going Tornado, and there's, there's a few uh, other albums out there. They're all interesting fusion albums, with an occasional vocal by Jeff Berlin, and guest Barbara Gaskin, from, also from Hatfield and the North and National Health. So, what does is, what is this stuff sound like? It's not as complex and rhythmically intricate as you would think having worked with yes king crimson and genesis but it's still very good i mean uh, bruford is an excellent drummer an original style but he chose to give the hand over the vocals to berlin and occasionally barbara gaskin and i just really personally wasn't am not crazy about Jeff Berlin's vocals. They, they bring a, a native pop tenor to music that is almost, almost doesn't call for it. But that's what Bruford wanted. In 81, he rejoined King Crimson and as a member of a foursome, including Robert Fripp, Tony Levin, and Adrian Ballou, they released some great mid-period Crimson albums called Discipline in 81, Beat in 82, and Three of a Perfect Pier. Now, during this period, Bill Bruford uh, experimented with a new technique, an acoustic electronic drum kit and sampling. This is the dawn of the age of guitar sampling, keyboard sampling, and also drum sampling. Um, the sounds coming on, on out of those King Crimson albums probably shook so many Bruford fans because like, what is this? This is different. This is electronic, but yet not. So Bruford adapted, changed. He was really into this whole thing. He teamed up with another former Yes uh, alumni, Patrick Moraz. And they did two albums, and they formed a band called Earthworks. And Earthworks was a return to Bruford's more jazz fusion period. But it gets more interesting. In 1989, Bruford was uh, in uh, contact with John Anderson, uh, Rick Wakeman, Steve Howe from Yes!, and he thought there was a band being bandied about called Cinema. It was uh, after the Yes album, Drama. 
There were various incarnations of the band. They were wondering what they were going to do. And then Bruford liked what they were doing in the studio. So he says, I will join them. And then they became Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, and Howe. They stayed around for the eight-member Yes Tour because suddenly Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, and Howe, they did tour, not a very lengthy one, but they did, they did tour under that name. And then he decided, well, maybe this incarnation, they, would, they brought some other members on, they're going to call the band Cinema. But as they got into the studio, they just said, why not be Yes again? This time, Yes had eight members in it, past, present, so the album that resulted out of that was called Union, which I will speak of, as well as the Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman, and Howe material when I do part two of the big Yes uh, show. I did part one uh, a show or two ago. Um, Bruford stayed on the, stayed around for the tour, but he did not like the direction that Yes was going into. And so he left again. He returned one more time uh, and joined the symphonic music of Yes, a curiously missing Steve uh, Chris Squire. And instead, on an, uh, an all too familiar name, which was also joined on keyboards, Dee Palmer from Jethro Tull. Um, the album was recorded with the London Philharmonic Orchestra, and it was curiously under-promoted by the label at the time, RCA Victor. So what was the symphonic music of? Yes, it was almost like a classical album that took choice select Yes music, had a band with Bruford Anderson on occasional vocals and, and, and such, but it... It was a mystery who was skewed for. Was it skewed for the Yes fans or was it skewed for the classical market who tried to bring over more pop sensibilities? It's very not easy to find nowadays, that's for sure. So Bruford again returned to King Crimson as a member of a, who was now a six-piece band in the 90s. Uh, he joined Pat Mastoletto, who's still with Crimson, on drums. Vroom? released in 94, Thrack, released in 95, and two, and two live albums followed. Uh, this version of King Crimson has a more improvisational sound, pretty out there. But Bruford left again. We reformed Earthworks and experimented uh, with a uh, rock jazz kind of thing with Tony Levin, who was and is in Crimson, and a band called Bruford Levin Upper Extremities. Bruford uh, went, to, went back to school, and he now has a PhD in music, and in 2009 officially announced, he, he announced he was officially retiring from uh, performing, and he released his autobiography that same year. And oddly enough, uh, it reads like a thesis. And it probably was his PhD thesis. And he probably decided, let me just touch it up and I will release this um, as my autobiography. It's not an easy read. It's very technical in parts, but it does give you information as well. There's a lot of dirt on record labels. and um, So although he officially retired from performing, Bill Bruford has played in a local club, uh, an R&B and jazz band near his home. He has popped up on occasion on uh, various albums by bands. He sat in with some name bands who were in the area of England where he lives. And in recent years, he has started up Winterfold Records, which uh, he, he went back to the um, the tapes he had laying around and 
he found stuff like uh, a fourth album of unfinished Bruford era material, which would feature Berlin, John Clark, Dave Stewart, and himself. And uh, he uh, did this as a double, actually. So it's the fourth album rehearsal sessions. And it does sound like unfinished songs. Some of them cut off after a few minutes without going anywhere. But the nice thing on here is uh, the band at that time period live at the venue. Um, liner notes are skimpy of any kind. But Bruford has promised to go back and re-release, or in the case of this, release material that no one has previously heard. And so uh, he's also currently working on a large box set of material he's done over the years with bands he's played with and with Bruford and with Earthworks and Mraz and others. And uh, I believe that'll see the light of day at some point. So one final note. So I, I mentioned a personal, I won't say dislike, but non-preference for Jeff Berlin's voice. So the Bruford tapes, which I held up before, it's interesting because Bruford toured a lot with this band. He, he really wanted to get out there. He wanted people to see, you know, I'm not just with Kent Crimson. I'm not just with Yes. I'm not just with Genesis. And a lot of places they play, especially on the East Coast, are small areas like Long Island. And he played uh, My Father's Place. <clears throat> in Roslyn, Long Island, and WLIRFM 92.7 at the time, would simulcast a lot of shows. And this album actually contains uh, a number of two, a number of tunes from, from those broadcast tapes. There's also other stuff out there, but I found it quite interesting that uh, it's good. It's good. I really enjoy it. There's actually less Jeff Berlin vocals happen to be at this time that they recorded this in 1979 than there are on some other Bruford albums. So anyway, I, I really respect Bill Berg. I think he's an amazing drummer. He's one of the best out there. Uh, whether he has truly retired, you're a musician, you know, and it gets into you, you you pick up your instrument and you or if you're on the side and you're like, if you're still able to do it. I think he felt there was no thing pushing him. He couldn't see something to make him go be with the band or create. But there are a lot of people that retire that come back. So anyway, it's an appreciation of Bill Bruford, who was still with us, by the way, so this wasn't a tribute to someone who had passed on. And so, uh, thank you for listening. I, maybe I talked about some Bruford albums you didn't know, or some appearances you didn't know. Like, I think we all forgot he was on Genesis. Well, I did for a portion of time. Or how many great Yes albums he was on. His tenure with Crimson, on, off, on. It's, it's some of their best Crimson albums out there, too. So anyway, thank you for listening. Have a great day. Stay well. Stay safe. Goodbye.